you buy a console for its exclusives. This is a phrase oft repeated because competing consoles can be indistinguishable except for content excluded on the other platform. Right now, the PS4 has the exclusive advantage in quantity and quality. But looking back, was this always the case with the PS4? Gamers have a very convenient memory when it comes to the launch of the Xbox One and the PS4. Xbox One, Force DRM, and the PS4 launched with compelling exclusives. Wait. <laughs> this wasn't the true story. The Xbox One had its horrible launch with DRM issues that were overturned in days after its six-month pre-release reveal. The truth is simple. The PS4 launched $100 cheaper and the Xbox One had the better first-year lineup of exclusives. Although the PS4 had a couple of standout hits in the first two years with Bloodborne and Until Dawn, the PS4 started rough with big early generation games like Infamous Second Son, Killzone Shadowfall, Drive Club, and The Order 1886 getting average review scores. But the PS4 being slightly more powerful than the Xbox One became the preferred place to play and most importantly, the best place to review the year's biggest multi-plat games. Once the Xbox One had hit its stride with Sunset Overdrive, Titanfall, Forza Horizon 2 and 3, Ori and Gears of War, PS4 had finally arrived with the heroic landing of Uncharted 4. It was at this point, midway through 2016, that PS4 had delivered on their two-year-long mantra, Greatness Awaits. And once 2017 was finished, Sony had provided Horizon Zero Dawn and the Uncharted Lost Legacy expansion, and a slew of well-reviewed, smaller third-party games that weren't available on the Xbox One. This developed a mindset among PS4 gamers that Sony's console had been providing a steady stream of amazing games. While Xbox suffered through a year-long slump of mediocre games with mediocre sales and mediocre review scores. The very best of Sony's PS4 exclusives were propped up with platform remasters due to a lack of backward compatibility support. And according to Metacritic, an aggregate review score site, PS4 had four 90 and above scored games this generation. That's if we're not including remasters or ports. Contrast this with Xbox One's singular hit in Forza Horizon 3 that propels a chorus of PS4 fans saying, <laughs> Sony's been providing hit after hit. This is the roadmap of gigantic games on the way such as Spider-Man, The Last of Us 2, Days Gone, Ghost of Tsushima, and Death Stranding. Whereas Microsoft has nothing but ambiguity for the future games coming to Xbox. Besides a shoddy track record, even though four versus one seems small, it's still four times more than the Xbox and it still does not tell the whole story. Let's come back to Metacritic for a bigger perspective. 80 and above scored games on the PS4 comes to a count of just over 60 games. 18 of them are prominent games and the additional 45 are indie games all listed on Metacritic that you've likely never heard of, let alone bother buying. There are a few standout titles in there like the exceptional Nex Machina and Resogun, but compared to the Xbox One's 10 titles above 80 on Metacritic, PS4 has the Xbox One beaten two full with the big titles and six times with a variety of games, even if they are quite obscure. In fact, stick around for the end of the video. I'm going to list out all 45 of those games on PlayStation that you probably haven't heard of, and you'll probably be surprised. Why do I choose Metacritic as a measurement of the game's quality? Well, we could argue that any game is up to interpretation to be totally amazing or absolute trash depending on our preference or our mood, but an aggregate score averaged out by seven to 60 professional review sites is about as objective as can be. Except there's one problem with Metacritic as a whole, and it is affecting fanboys, console and game sales, and even the people responsible and paid for providing us with our favorite games. I don't know who's right or wrong in this. Metacritic did acknowledge that there is some weighting that goes to various sites over others, but that the people on the panel had gotten it wrong, missing the forest for the trees. 
that doesn't seem right. That my opinion, which could come from a day where I'm in a really foul mood and I skew something down because it's an opinion, can somehow go into something that's mathematical that doesn't seem to make any sense. And it's really troubling that we've created this monster and there are very few people who want to step up and say, hey, there's something wrong with this. The power of Metacritic is to the point that while I was at G4, we had a one to five system. But then I came back in 2013 to find out that we had moved to a half-star system as well. And it was all at the behest of one very, very large publisher who said that we wouldn't be taken seriously unless we were listed on Metacritic. Metacritic partially denies the claim here and says the study assumes and calculates beyond the truth. But the important takeaway here is that the larger sites, deemed more influential based on their size and their presence in the gaming community, can affect the score of games more than the industry reviewers as a whole. Does this mean that there is a media bias and that is why PS4 games generally score higher than the Xbox One? Absolutely not. After all, some of PS4's early bigger games were branded with lower scores. But fanboys and even industry sites lean on Metacritic as a proving ground for a game's success or failure. Most sites, and looking at the ratio of 2 to 3 reviews on the PS4 for every one review on the Xbox One, since Sony has made little to no mistakes with a no-frills approach to the PS4, industry professionals have chosen long ago to make the PS4 their preferred platform to review games. And with that is the inclusion of the majority of professional reviews coming from a large presence of PlayStation media sites outnumbering Xbox media outlets. This doesn't force 100 out of 100 scores due to media bias, but it sways the aggregate scores slightly in favor of the preferred console. This has motivated PS4 console sales to surpass Xbox One by a factor of two. That double console sales gap has motivated third-party studios that normally released multi-platform like Ninja Theory, From Software, and Capcom to release exclusively to PS4. But one thing that both platform owners can agree on is that Xbox and PlayStation offer totally different exclusive experiences. Xbox is focused on multiplayer and co-op offerings. In fact, very few PS4 exclusives offer a cooperative-driven online experience. PS4 does not offer a unique four-player mainstream game. Uncharted 4 offers multiple online modes to extend the playtime of a great game, but jumping into a game headfirst with a friend is not part of the PS4 offering. Forza, Gears, Dead Rising, State of Decay, and Halo can all be played from the first moments to the very end in online competitive or co-op. This is the massive difference that depending on what kind of gamer you are, where the PS4 and the Xbox One divide. Xbox One offers the unique online exclusive experience and PS4 offers unparalleled, single-player, emotionally connected storytelling with unmatched gameplay. Look at the similarities between The Last of Us, Uncharted 4, Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, and Days Gone. All are cut from the same cloth. The third person, over-the-shoulder view with great combat and a story tied to family and personal struggle. This is something that Xbox One has only attempted to match with Gears of War 4, and that is where the similarities end. Xbox just does not offer anything like the PS4 template. Even if we only counted the 19 mainstream, well-rated PS4 exclusives versus Xbox One's 10 exclusives, PS4 still offers more, and the highly rated games like Bloodborne, Uncharted 4, and God of War tower over the best Xbox has to offer. Five out of the 19 games here are MLB The Show games, and a couple of games like Nier Automata and Nio will likely make their way to the Xbox One. As PS4-only gamers seem to shout like a chorus, Sony is giving me banger after banger. The reality is Sony's first-party studios only provide a small portion of the exclusives, and Sony is reaping the benefits of incredible third-party support that cannot be played on an Xbox. I'd say that all of this comes down to personal preference, and that the Metacritic scores, the sales, and the reviews don't matter and to play where you want and what you want. But the 2016 through 2018 steady stream of quality games on PS4 has cemented PS4 into an excellent position. But looking at the mass majority of gamers on all platforms, remember online-centric games like Fortnite, Call of Duty, FIFA, Madden are truly what pushes console sales. 
And having the price advantage of the PS4 in 2013, the console sale was won long before Sony planted smash hits on the PS4. And right now, it's truly the cherry on top of an already great platform. This is Colt Eastwood. Thank you so much for watching. If you've made it this far, here are those 45 indies that you've probably never played and maybe never even heard of. Zero Escape, Everything, Robbie Roby, Downwell, Scale Run Extended, Darius Burst, Yakuma Kiwami, Disengia 5, Steins Gate, Dragon Crown RPG, Children of Zodiacs, Helldivers, Tearaway Unfolded, Dangaropa V3, Zen Pinball, Zen Pinball 2, Zen Pinball 3, Sprint Vector, Sports Friends, Galaxy Dimensions, I Expect You to Die, Nuclear Throne, Iconoclast, Steamworld Heist, Transistor, Dragon Quest Builders, Payu Payu Tetris, Trine 2, Hatsune Miku, Detention, Polybus, Salt and Sanctuary, Blaze Blue, Guilty Gear, XRD, Static, Moss, Pyre, Wise 8, DJ Max Respect, Odin Sphere, and Talos Principle. 45 indie games rated 80 or higher on Metacritic. I'd like to predict that a lot of people are going to be claiming damage control or Xbox fanboyism in the comments, but it doesn't matter. For the first time, I am truly anticipating a multi-platform E3 conference experience to see what Microsoft and Sony have in store for my PS4 and my Xbox One next year. Like I said, PS4, it's my perfect secondary console. Already this past few months, I played the incredible Uncharted 4, God of War, and I've just started a few hours into Horizon Zero Dawn. And I can't wait to get Spider-Man at the end of the year. But on Xbox, I'll mostly be occupied with Forza Horizon 4, Far Cry 5 expansions, more of State of Decay, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Red Dead Redemption 2, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, all of those on Xbox One X. If you want to hear my take on E3, join us on RDX Sunday afternoon Pacific Standard Time for a live broadcast. Check back to my channel for a fully produced recap. And if you like this video, let me know by rating it and subscribe to hear more as I put out videos every week. It's weird that we get so polarized in comment sections and online about one platform versus another. So remember before you comment today that <laughs> I'm not your enemy and since we don't always agree, I'm just trying to take a more objective approach, but it seems like some people, they can't tolerate positive talk on their opposing console. But you know, some are gonna fight anyways, but I hope you're having an enjoyable time in your games, and I hope you're having fun with your friends, but just remember to have fun, and as always, be nice.